Hi, my name is Jeremiah Sheet, creator of Hush Ronin and Frosty the Hellmouth. You can find my work at www.jsheet.com, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented artist and writer and comic creator. I fell in love with his artwork as soon as I went to his page and clicked on his very first images of the Sandman tarot cards that he happened to create as well, too. But he's done much more than just that as well, too. We're joined today by the ever-talented Jeremiah Sheck. How are you doing? Today? Uh, very well. Thank you, Kurt. How about good. yourself? Doing good. Doing good. Who are you? And tell us what you are creatively. Usually get credited professionally as J. Sheik or J. Paul Sheik. Uh, the J stands for Jeremiah. Um, I am a primarily comic book artist. I found it's uh, much more lucrative to draw other people's projects than it is to try to get my my own up and running, although I do have some of those as well. My samurai comic, Hush Ronin, is uh, slated for production with Band of Bards in winter of this year. Uh, I have another one going through Foreign Press Comics, uh, just a one-shot about a demon-possessed ginormous snowman ravaging a small Idaho town. There's a, a lot of other ones that I'm currently working on with, with other, other writers and collaborators that I can talk about in varying degrees. I do keep pretty busy with a lot of projects kind of all at once. It's great to see that your samurai comic is being published through them as well, too. What does Band of Bards Publishing bring to your project? The biggest thing that I, I picked up from them is their integrity. They're a pretty new publisher. They had put out, I remember very hurriedly putting my pitch pack together. I mean, to the point where I'm like, I like I doubt they'll even look at this at this point because I got it in like right under the wire with a few sample pages. But having interacted with them sort of through their genesis as a company and their expansion on social media and talking with Tim Stolinski and, and others at an individual level. And, you know, once they expressed an interest that once that dialogue kind of got started, I just really liked what they were about. They've been very on the level, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, working with, I won't call it, say, like a more established publisher, but something bigger that's been around perhaps a little longer, where there might be a little bit more room for getting pushed aside or like, yep, this is how we're doing it. Don't care what you think. I've had a lot of creative control along the way, especially with this story because it's changed so many times and gone in so many different directions from like the original first drawings and stories that I started writing for it that they want a clear direction for me, which I appreciate. So that keeps me on the ball in that department, but it also lets me do what I need to do to make this what I ultimately see it as being. So tell us the the concept then of, of that comic and, you know, how did you come up with it? Hush Ronin is about a Ronin samurai who can't speak. Originally, I had drawn him as like a Lego figure almost. He was this cute little chibi doll creation. I don't know if I have that on my website or not, but there is a Hush Ronin section in there. I might put that up because I, I do have the original like first ever drawing that I did for the character. And the idea was that he was sort of a, a braggart or not a good character in some sense, like an anti-hero. And that the gods intervened and took his voice from him or his mouth, really, because he was a cartoon character. It made more practical sense to take his mouth away from him and refuse to give it back until he had done some uh, kind of like a, a reinvention of the labors of Hercules to try to make up for uh, who, who was it that he, he'd saved? Was it Prometheus from the rocks? So, yeah. Making up for his error in that sense. And then, you know, he's forever pursuing getting his mouth back and then learning things along the way that he doesn't necessarily need it to build a strong character in the minds of those around him. What was the first image that popped into your head that would develop into the story you created? Uh, I had just the image of the samurai. Uh, I mean, he was just this little, I mean, almost like a chess piece kind of composition to his figure. And it was very incidental. I had drawn eyes and I think a, a suggestion of a nose, and then I couldn't decide what the mouth needed to look like to match the, the shape language of the character. And so I just didn't draw one, you know, after a, a period of time when I, you know, I'd finished painting it and coloring it in, I came back to do the mouth and I realized, I think there's a story there, you know, of, of why he doesn't have a mouth. Uh, I mean, apart from that, I couldn't decide in a um, design sense what it should look like. 
so I cut the mouth out and I started developing the story that way. Maybe about a year and a half into it, I had started grad school at Cal State Fullerton, going back to get my my Master of Fine Arts degree in illustration, and had decided to use um, the Hush Ronan concept as a semester project to build a portfolio around through group critique. You know, I brought in those original drawings and presented the story, and it was pretty unanimous. Everybody thought that the story, as I was handling it, then was a little too violent or visceral for the cutesy kind of shape language I had developed around it kind of began to evolve. I made the character a little bit in the Tintin kind of category as far as, you know, what he looked like, like Stan Sakai's uh, Usagi Ojimbo, which I was reading a lot of at the time. And then finally, in around May of 2018, I grabbed everything that I had. I still have about seven or eight pages of the, the cartoonish version. But around 2018, I went full-blown like Akira Kurosawa, black and white, very rough edge samurai movie with it and haven't gone back. So what's the hardest part about being an artist? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? For me, it's always been the end. The beginning is always exciting. Uh, the middle can be a little frustrating. I kind of chalk it up to my ADHD being a factor in that, but you know, finishing something can be terrifying. It can be disappointing. It, the The beginning is all about getting that carrot dangling for a project and the middle is about chasing it. But catching the carrot is to quote the Joker from Dark Knight, you know, like I'm a dog, like a dog chasing a car. I wouldn't know what to do if I caught one. Uh, it's kind of like that. Like, well, what happens when I catch the carrot? Where is the next carrot going to come from? And how good is it going to taste compared to this previous carrot? That's a good analogy. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, as an artist, then what is the the best advice for other artists that are starting out, especially maybe those with with ADHD? The two big things that have been crucial to my success, I would say, are keep drawing, kind of no matter what. Always be working on something. If it's your own, great. If it's something you're working on with a friend or another collaborator or a writer, keep working on something. The other big one is the networking aspect. You know, you start meeting people that can lead to new collaborations. I kind of got my start, at least in a professional sense, where I started getting paid to draw comics on Twitter right around the same time I did the, Kuros the Kurosawa overhaul on Hush Ronin. was living in Temecula, California at the time, Marietta, which is adjacent to it there and working at the Apple store. And I happened to meet uh, Marco Finnegan, who was from the same area. You know, he was coming in to look at iPads as a possible uh, tool for drawing his own comics. If you're not familiar, familiar with Marco, he did send some work with Image like Crossroad Blues. That's one I know of off the top of my head in my library. It's a kind of a similar artist to myself. He likes the realistic human figures, put him kind of in like the David Mazzuccelli school hmm. um, as far as his, his output. He was mentioning some opportunities that he had had and that most of his paid work, at least at that time, came from Twitter, which was something that I had not as yet explored. So that same week, I resuscitated my personal account, which I hadn't used in several years and mm -hmm. kind of hung out my shingle as a comic book artist. And within a couple of weeks, I'd landed two paid jobs, you know, slow going, but you know, each one of those that you do is something that you can point back to. And then that can lead to the next work like, oh, hey, I saw your work on Trench Stalker. Um, would you be interested in doing this this other piece? It's set in World War II or you know whatever it happens to be. But you're not only an artist, but you're a writer as well too. What energizes you more creatively? Is it writing, drawing, or is it both? I would have to say both, but rarely simultaneously. There was a time where I just wanted to be a writer. Um, I was penning novels. I, I got an agent at the Curtis Brown Agency in New York to look at a pirate novel I'd written back in 2007 or so. Ultimately, they didn't decide to represent it. And at that point, I, I kind of shelved it after that. I didn't end up doing another draft. I'm terrible about, about drafts anyway. I, I redrafting things. I've, I've kind of come up with some personal tools to say proactively sabotage myself into writing a second draft of something. They're often kind of the same thing in a sense too, you know, if, if I'm drawing just on a blank sheet of paper with the intention of creating a character, I'm sort of writing some intention into that, who the character is represented by what they look like or what they carry. 
uh, how they carry themselves, that kind of thing. With comics, it can get intensely confusing for me was stopping point for a lot of years was I didn't really understand how comics were made from the position of a writer, artist, creator, you know, kind of synthesis in one person. Is it the script first or does the art come first? For me, it's for my own stuff. It tends to be more the art first. I realized when I started needing to have a script to show anybody that the script really just became a description of things that I had already drawn. I'm overcoming that and starting to write more uh, in script form, kind of pre-visualizing the comic, at least in some sense, creating detailed instructions as sort of a, a letter to my future self to draw or to potentially another artist if that ever happens where I'm just in the writing chair, not writing something that I, I intend to draw or have already drawn, I guess. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? The one that comes to mind, I was really young, probably four or five years old. My parents had taken us to uh, uh, another family's house for dinner. There were like three families meeting for, for the adults to have a dinner and play board games. And then the kids were sequestered away in a, a, a bedroom. We're just playing around. One of the one of the kids happened to be my best friend at the time and his older sister. And at some point, the older sister got mad at my friend and yelled fuck at him. And I thought it was the funniest word I'd ever heard in my life. So I immediately committed it to memory. It was getting kind of late. Uh, but next morning, I go out to the living room and my parents had a big, big stereo set up and with the, the big over the ear, like pilot headphones. So I pop those things on and I'm sitting out there in the living room, just fuck, 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 like <laughs> dancing away. And my mom comes out and she's looking at me like I just murdered somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and the paddle comes out and I'm like panicked because I'm like, I don't know what I did wrong. Um, I just heard this really funny word for that, that kind of a, a single syllabic thing to produce that kind of a response from a figure of authority to where I was about to get my ass beat over it. I didn't. I was able to explain it away and uh, I pinned the blame for where it belonged on my best friend's older sister. Uh, I don't know that she ever got in trouble over that or not, but it was just like a, like, wow. I've come to realize it more with writing that like Stephen King describes it as a mode of telepathy in his book on writing, you know, that you're conveying ideas, not just from one mind to another without technically speaking, but you're doing it across time um, in the sense that, you know, we can still pick up transmissions from Charles Dickens or, you know, some of the earliest people to pick up a, a pen uh, so long as we can translate what it, what it was they were writing or whatever language or form of alphabet. That was kind of a very fundamental one for me. Uh, it always kind of sticks in my mind as, as one of those, like, okay, words have power uh, and they can get you into trouble. They can save you from it, depending on what order you put them in. So looking at, at Hush Ronan here itself, you know, what was the hardest scene for you to write and draw? The hardest part has actually been kind of revising it. A lot of what I have, it's gone through through different versions of kind of the same story centered really around the same character. I had done a version back in 2018 with the character initially being able to speak. Um, he gets his uh, mouth taken away or his voice taken away in a duel with a shape-shifting kitsune or a nine-tailed nine fire fox that gets unleashed that's still, I believe, going to be part of the story, but I have it sort of changed the aspect of that a bit. Shifting it back around to what it is now, I've got something that's got a, a little bit more breadth in terms of time where we meet the character much earlier on in his life as like a preteen whose village is burned to the ground by like a rival warlord. Well, the village headman who happened to be his father wouldn't wouldn't commit to their cause. And so anybody who didn't was basically wiped off the map. The ones who weren't were, you know, assimilated into the, into this kind of growing faction. So he gets cut loose from that. He manages to survive and he's one of, might, might be the only one as far as the, the story shows or is really concerned with jumping into his story later on, went back and tied it to other things that I, I worked on over the years to build a sort of larger mythology. Drawing it, I think 
the hardest part for me with, with anything like, especially with period pieces, because this is sort of in that Edo, um, I put it maybe in the 1600s, late 1500s, early 1600s, as far as where, where things pick up, because I've wanted to do some overlap with figures from Elizabethan England in there, because I've got a, just a fascination with that, that time period. So having sort of a like a Pocahontas kind of moment for him, getting taken back to England as a curiosity and how he manages manages to get back to Japan. Architecture, going for like period accuracy so I don't have any weird anachronistic buildings or styles or, or things like that and wanting wanting to be true to it for that reason that it's not just like a, oh, that building looks Japanese so I put it in there. I want to be as sensitive as I can to the the source what is it about history that fascinates you as a as a creative person i don't know i i it seems unchangeable um but there's this this sense like it's it's almost like a swimming pool i could jump into if i could just get through the security gate i'm a sucker for a good time travel story reading history or jumping into it in an immersive sense is about as close as i feel i'll ever get to actual time travel so getting in and finding the small details of what life was like how people would have felt just on an average day and things they would have eaten how they would have eaten it how they would have you know gotten from place to place all that that kind of stuff fascinates me what is your creative kryptonite it's having a full and unbridled like space to work in. I, I need limitations that is what I, I find. It's like, I think it's the obstacle that defines the track, not so much just the the broad open space. If I don't have their own and not being able to speak in itself is kind of a limitation because then it's like, okay, well then how does he interact with people? And now I've, I'm having to come to creative solutions to work out how he gets by in this world where he needs to be able to speak, but can't. In just absolutely zero obstacles, it, it's sort of transcendent of the whole process. So, you know, if, if I had access to every single tool I could possibly need, even the most expensive equipment or software, those kinds of things, it feels like it takes all the consequence out of it. And then I'm stuck with this moment well, stuck, but it's just, there's, there's, there's neither a right nor a wrong wrong decision to make that's, this is my dad <laughs> oh that's cool no that's awesome <laughs> uh, i was just like there's a guy behind you i don't i don't know why why is he going to yeah yeah it's it's all good it feels like one of those creative writing classes that uh I, I took a creative writing course my, my very first semester of junior college and the uh professor in there used to have an exercise he would do where he had a friend um, who would come into the classroom completely unannounced in the middle of class one one session with a briefcase. He'd go up to the class and he'd speak, you know, very furtively with a the professor. They'd open the briefcase and look inside and make sure nobody was looking. Then he'd close the briefcase up and then walk back out. And then once he was gone and the students were, you know, sufficiently wondering what the hell had just happened, he'd tell them to write down what you just saw. And then that became the prompt. So if anybody else saw that. But no. <laughs> Nameology, I think, is always interesting when it comes to character creation and development of various stories and, and what you've created here. You know, what are some inspirations for your names when it came to uh, Hush Run? Well, Hush Run in itself is because I was sort of envisioning it initially as like a, a manga. The name kind of came along very just sort of out of nowhere. It's almost like the wind whispered it. Um, I've had that happen with other characters. I have a character who I've gone through multiple evolutions of named Sheldon Meatwater. And I think that was a my mind's sort of version of the juvie fiction writer, Sidney Pinkwater. I was working at Barnes & Noble and that just, just popped in my head. So I wrote it down and I've been using it for a lot ever since. Um, but Hush Ronin, the two that I can point to are the actual, the Jim Lee um, Batman arc, Hush, that new villain. And then uh, Frank Miller's Ronin, and at least in my head, that's what I sort of tie it back to. Uh, I try not to put too much effort into names as far as coming up with them. I, I like it when they feel effortless or they have some kind of a rhythm to them. I, I usually know when it's right and I'll, I'll write, it, write it down. I had one last night. Now I can't remember what it was. It was Dr. Noman Cleft or something like that often. They just kind of keep a list. And then if something fits, I can kind of draw from that. What is your favorite underappreciated novel or comic? Ooh. Oh, man. That's a tough one. Most of my favorites have been pretty well appreciated. <laughs> um, 
I've been reading a lot of Michael Connolly lately, uh, mm-hmm. just because I, I get into I like police procedurals and detective fiction. Uh, what's the most under underappreciated genre that you enjoy that other people may not? I, I have to say crime. Um, mm-hmm. Not not that it, I'm say that it's underappreciated, but it feels like such a small subset of the reading population gets into like heavy crime stuff, and not not where it's a hero detective figures out what the situation is and catch, catches all the bad guys. But even one where the criminals themselves are the protagonists of the story. Uh, I'm a really big fan of Ed Brubaker's work with uh, Sean Phillips on the Criminal series, Fatal, Fade Out. I just reread that uh, this, this past December or so. It's a bit like Breaking Bad, I guess. That, that's another, another good example of it where you've got this unquestionably bad person who is in the, you know, you're, you're rooting for them to to get away with this horrible stuff that they're doing just because that, that just happens to be the position they occupy in the, the lens of the story. I like stuff that, that does that. I wouldn't say it's a genre necessarily, but stories where, you know, it sort of forces you into uh, a standpoint that you might not naturally take within, you know, your moral sphere. Crime does a really good job of creating those kinds of opportunities, I think. At what point are we good enough? <laughs> Um, my brain's just screaming never right now. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I, and I don't know that that's, that's the right answer. Um, I think, I think as a, as a creator should always be striving to be better that the next one that you make should always be better than the one that came just before it, at least in, in some sense. Um, I think for the projects themselves, though, to transfer or transplant that that pursuit of perfection that one faces internally and then put the same imposition on a project is the kiss of death for that project. Um, you, know, where you hear people say, you know, done is better than perfect. I completely agree with that. I, I think that a project can, itself can be good enough. I think that as a creator, if you're not looking to get better than you currently are, then you're, you've lost identity with a, a huge percentage of what it is to, to be working at all this stuff, unless you're just doing it solely for a paycheck, at, at which point you might question why. If it's steady pay, then by all means, keep doing it. But with a personal connection to comics as, some, as a medium that I've enjoyed my, I mean, for as long as I can remember in my entire life and something that I've always wanted to do, it's one of those things where even if I wasn't getting paid to draw comics, I would still be drawing comics. It's what I'm wired up to do. So I, I think it's good, good enough is more, I mean, if you feel less passionately about the medium or if it's a means to an end for some other passion, then maybe that exists. I, I know for myself that I, I don't know that good enough is a, a place that I will reach personally. What is something everyone should do once in their lifetime? Travel abroad. Uh, or if you get the opportunity to live abroad in a different country with a different culture. I, I had that opportunity about 15 years ago to live in Italy for a year, and it utterly changed my life. Um, it was what got me back into art school when I came back to the States and showed me things that I don't think I would have would have seen otherwise. And I, I mean, it, it's kind of an expensive one, but... I, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, we lived in Florence. Oh, yeah. or, uh, actually, right there, half a block from the Duomo, right nice. in the historic center. Oh, the history of that place must have just really been awe-inspiring, too. Oh, it was it was nuts. It was also kind of strange how, if you're from there, it, get, it can be taken for granted. You know, like, there's graffiti on the sides of buildings that are older than anything in the United States, uh, older than the country itself. So that that, that to me was like, whoa. You know, there was a lot more air pollution and uh, noise pollution, there just cars and motorcycles everywhere than my preconceptions had led me to believe it would be like. So it, it was it was a completely different experience, and I'm glad that it was. It got to be itself, and I got to sort of test myself with that and learn a lot of valuable lessons from it. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your artistic career? Ooh, done is better than perfect is up there. This might actually be the wisest. This came from a history of animation professor at my undergrad days uh, who told us point blank, you know, never put aside paid work to do spec work. So if you have something you're being paid to do, 
don't work on a personal project or something that you're doing pro bono to instead of that finish the paid stuff first because you can live off of money you can't live off of exposure yes <laughs> yeah our personal satisfaction as much as we'd like to live off of that stuff oh man yeah i mean that, that was the case i'd be set but <laughs> oh, totally <laughs> what is one mistake that you'll never ever do again i hope i never do it again i had uh, a client new to comics kind of new to, to any of this stuff and the project that I was working on with this person ended in a disagreement because of, of time factors. Um, I had gotten wrapped up in some stuff. In fact, it involved going back to Italy for a week on, on vacation a couple of years ago. And we were leading a group tour at the time. So there were the stresses of that and managing the hopes and expectations of the others in the crew. You know, several of them were family members, but uh, some of them were more acquaintances than anything else. Um, so there was a level of delicacy that needed to be handled or to be used there. And the project had gotten kind of on hold on off and on. And I was working on it, but just not as fast as I believe this person wanted me to. And while things were not handled perfectly from their side, I can only speak to my own uh, temperament and how I handled myself in that. And I leapt to some conclusions and used some very conclusive language with the person. And I've felt bad about it ever since. I mean, it's one of those that still kind of haunts me, um, especially if I'm running behind deadline on something, which I try not to do um, as often as I can. It's sometimes, uh, especially lately with moving and everything, you know, life can get way ahead of you. I've made a commitment to myself to be just honest and forthright. If I can't finish something, if I'm if I'm running behind, not to make up excuses for it, not let anger or frustration at how somebody else might be mishandling their end of the conversation dictate how I end up mishandling my own. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I can think of a couple. I mean, it's because the the path has changed direction so many times as an animator it was chuck jones as you know where i'm at right now um i, I mean goes kind of going back to the beginning of when i started drawing entertainment art in any, in any capacity i was a really big fan of mark kistler's show secret city as a kid uh, in fact i would tape multiple sheets of computer paper together after, you know, dutifully pulling the ribbons off the sides because we had one of those dot matrix printers like that. I was called them the nerds because yeah. if you left them on, you were a nerd. Yeah, like learning to draw 3D and and working creatively with, with this broad open space. That was one of those areas where a lack of obstacles was actually useful to me because I had this, this space to try things. So I made like cartoon snakes with fishbowl astronaut helmets floating around these weird geometric space stations and things. And that, that feels like the one thing that kind of pushed me forward into comics and everything else that would come after and was foundational in the sense that I was learning how to draw draw things of that nature. So that, that's one that comes immediately to mind. There have been others. My professor at Cal State Fullerton, Cliff Cramp, he's not named for doing it, but probably most famously the artist who, he's the artist who painted the artwork on the Star Wars Blu-ray set when that came out back in 2010 for both the prequel and uh, original trilogies, just as the kind of work that he does, the industry, you know, as long as he's been in the industry and the things that he's worked on and just his personal character and willingness to jump in and help students was a, a, a major boost for me at many times during my academic career. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful artist you are a successful comic creator you have a book that will be published through band of bards professionally you have done many things in your career that makes you a successful person do you consider yourself a successful person i i do i mean in the the sense i want this to sound like me bragging on myself or something because I, I mean this of anybody who's ever done it ever that to to pursue something that you love um, especially if it's in the arts where your future is just the only certainty about it is that it's uncertain. You might make something that a lot of people love and it gets optioned for a show and Netflix buys the intellectual property and you become a millionaire or you write a comic that maybe 10 people in some remote area of the United States love and come out to see you at uh, this one convention every year or whatever it is. I think 
that if you're able to do that to any extent and maintain it and somebody's enjoying it, that that, that in itself is success not necessarily measured by its financial component. I've had to bolster it in other areas, but I feel like I've been successful in that too, that there were things in my life that I needed to escape. And I have definitely been able to do that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Historically, not well. I've definitely had my my dance with drinking and substance abuse in the past. You know, in failure was kind of a broad in terms of its definition. Uh, You know, it wasn't that I was unemployed or not working on something, but in a more personal sense, it felt like I had failed or things that I had really hoped or expected to happen had not happened the way they were hoped or expected to. And I fell into these long periods of, I would call it the self-pity and self-destruction. And I've stepped away from that. And I've been away from that for for some time and enjoying the healthful sense of what that is. And that that feels good. Failure is a lesson. I would also add in, I'm going to paraphrase Mark Twain on this, that, you know, one should never take too much from a lesson that a cat that sits on a hot stove will never sit on a hot stove again, but it will never sit on a cold one again either. Failure needs to be taking it personally or making it a, a permanent part of yourself, you can give it too much shelf space in your, your personal life. And I, I think that it needs to have some shelf space so that you remember what the failure was and ideally how to avoid it in the future. But at the same time, it shouldn't fill the entire trophy case, if that makes sense. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an artist or a writer or whatever they would like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I like to think it's a matter of attitude. Making something that looks really, really good and then being like an elusive or quiet person or being a complete asshole behind it or, you know, saying, oh, yeah, of course I made that. Like, I'm really good or having a conceited attitude behind it. I think being excited about the work and trying to create that transfer of enthusiasm or making your your excitement contagious is a huge part. I think the inspiration itself that I've drawn from other creators have been from ones who have loved the work or, you know, it shows in the work that they love it. Uh, it shows in an interview that they love it even up to the point that it breaks their heart, having something to show relationally to it at a personal level, I I think is what I latched on to more than anything. It's, it's nice to see somebody with a, with a cool approach, but sometimes they seem aloof or disconnected from it. It's just that it's this output that they happen to make and they're this entirely other person. I I like for the, the work and the person to be kind of the same thing uh, or just having that, that consistency and, and level of of positivity around it. Well, I do hate to say this, Jeremiah, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived, so thank you for (laughs) for coming on the show. I appreciate it. You're having me. Before I let you go, (laughs) where can we find you and how can we support you on social media and, and all of that fun stuff? I really only do Twitter and Instagram these days, and I use the same handle for both. It's at Sheikopedia. That's my last name, S C H I E K A P. E-D-I-A. It's a name I was given for, I guess it's better than Cliff Clavin, um, but it, it was just used to be known for having a lot of trivial knowledge in my head, and that, that was a name that stuck. I also have my website at www.jshik.com. This is J-S-C-H-I-E-K.com. I keep galleries of a lot of recent work up there. I do need to update it, but if you're interested in the the Sandman tarot cards that were mentioned at the beginning, I've got this fan art series that I'm doing, and pretty much all of them are up there. I think I've got two or three more I need to upload. I'll see about getting to that today. In fact, yeah, I think that's primarily it. That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, which is twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com and on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.